Listeners, readers, welcome to the Foxed page, where we dive deep into the very best books. You'll come away with a richer understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. I'm Kimberly Ford, best-selling author, one-time adjunct professor at Berkeley, and PhD in Spanish and French literature. I am so excited today to dive in to uh, one of our Jane Austen spinoffs, The Scandalous Confessions of Lydia Bennett Witch. Those of you on the YouTube channel um, might be noticing, in fact, that I have gone a little bit beyond the homemade sweater here, and the costuming department, honestly, uh, just has gotten completely ridiculous. I am really excited to dive in today to The Scandalous Confessions of Lydia Bennett Witch. Why are we reading this book? Well, in part because we just finished Pride and Prejudice, and I really love to dive in to the very best of these kind of Jane Austen derivatives. These titles, these novels that are sort of spin-offs that sort of imagine uh, a, like an extension of the world of Jane Austen and of Pride and Prejudice. And this was a book that really delivered. My intention was to do the deep dive with Pride and Prejudice, and then I was going to do like a little digest with maybe 15 minutes on Lydia Bennett Witch, Longbourn, and Mrs. Bennett Has Her Say. And then honestly, I so enjoyed Lydia Bennett here um, that I really felt like she, she needed her due. I needed to give Lydia her due. So part of that is just because the novel is so well structured and the narrative voice is so great. And it's really, I think, a very beautiful kind of parroting of Jane Austen while also really, um, you know, providing a couple of larger messages that I think are very valuable. Today is not going to be like a full, full uh, deep dive, but I really did want to spend some time talking about the following. Here's an agenda for those of you who like an agenda. We're going to first uh, just very quickly talk about the biography of Melinda Taub. We are then going to dive into the text. We'll talk briefly about the title and about the opening, which is really excellent. We're going to talk about the structure of this novel and really um, a lot of things that this complex and well done structure are allowing in the novel. And then um, we're going to talk about figurative language. It's so cool what she does with figurative language. Um, I'll give you a brief teaser right now, which is that, um, and when I say figurative language, I simply mean language that is, is doing more than what is on the page. So when you have language that is providing a certain message, but then there's sort of another hidden message. So think of metaphor, think of simile, personification, symbolism, all of those things you learned about in 10th grade English. Um, but this is a very good example of when we should ask, so what? It's very good as you are reading if you can identify, for example, symbolism or uh, pathetic fallacy, which is simply when the weather is sort of um, mimicking whatever the character is feeling. Or if you notice that something is a beautiful simile or a beautiful metaphor, it's important to go one step further and say, so what? And in this case, Melinda Taub really delivers. And the teaser is simply that I believe that you can read the entire narrative of, of kind of witchiness as a stand-in or a metaphor for feminism. So I really um, am excited to dig deeper into that when we get to the figurative language part of the lecture. Okay, we're gonna dive into a, a very quick bio of Melinda Taub. There actually was not a lot on the internet. My sense is that she maybe went to high school in Illinois. Uh, she has become a comedy writer and most famously wrote for Full Frontal with Samantha Bee. She was also very involved with the Upright Citizens Brigade. That's that comedy troupe, or it's like a, I think it's like a school, but it's also a comedy troupe. Really important people have come out of that. I think it's maybe in Chicago and also in Los Angeles, um, but clearly she has some very uh, developed skill in terms of writing comedy. And while I do not find the scandalous confessions of Lydia Bennett Witch particularly like hilarious, you can tell that this is someone who really does have some excellent writing skills. And there are lots of um, sort of clever things that really do have a hint of humor in this book that, that, that come, I think, in part from her humor, but mostly I was impressed that she is someone who can really dig into, uh, you know, a good Jane Austen derivative and really produce an excellent novel, uh, but also, in fact, has some amazing comedy chops. She also wrote a, a novel that was a YA novel. I believe it's a rewriting of Romeo and Juliet. It's called Still Star-Crossed, and it was produced for television by Shonda Land, uh, Shonda Rhimes, another Dartmouth graduate, in fact, in my class. 
1991. Um, wow, she is just crushing, man. Shonda, wow. So um, we have this this comedy writer who has done both this adaptation of Romeo and Juliet and is now turning her attentions, I think very successfully, to Pride and Prejudice. So that's the perfect segue into the title. You guys all know, anyone who has been listening for a while, know that I am definitely not immune to an excellent cover. I think this cover is excellent. The book came out in October, I believe, so uh, this was right on point in terms of a very autumnal kind of, um, you know, palette that we have on the front of this. It's also, of course, very witchy. I think they were very smart to release it in the fall. I do believe it was October, which, again, good, good work. Good work, marketing team. I really also like these silhouettes. I like the fact that the man and the woman here are facing each other. And you have um, you know these silhouettes that are very in keeping with what you might have had in the Regency era in terms of you know those those silhouettes that people would have or like a little cameo that you would have in your brooch in your brooch, wow brooch brooch. Um, so and I also really like this kind of old timey script. It really does remind us of uh, of the Regency period, but it also in fact is um, is very witchy just given the old timey feel. I like, of course, the black cat up at the top, a little nod to the magic. And uh, I really also love the idea that Lydia Bennett is really, um, you know, primary in terms of the title because that is what caught my eye. I think that when you dive into the world of Jane Austen and you expand it with a novel like this, it's really tempting for anyone who likes Austen, even remotely. I am not a huge Austen fan. I'm going to confess that again. I confessed it with Pride and Prejudice. Um, I came to Austen kind of late. I think I read something, you know, probably in high school or college or something and just was like not that wowed, which is so weird in retrospect because I have so much respect for her now. But her work is not something that like deeply touches me. Mostly it just really impresses me. But so um, whenever I see a familiar name of any any of the Bennett girls. I mean, I would even read like a, a, you know, a thing about Mary Bennett. Poor Mary, man. She's like, it's just a little, ooh, she's a little bit the unloved sister of the five. But we have this uh, really, I think, interesting and intriguing book because of course, Lydia is definitely the black sheep of the family. So I like the idea of this Lydia Bennett really being first and foremost. And I also really like the idea of Lydia Bennett being synonymous here with witch. So in terms of grammar, this is called an appositive. So if you have Lydia Bennett, comma, which, it's basically like a little equals sign. So what we're saying here is Lydia Bennett equals which. And of course, as I said before, if we are going to look at all of the kind of witchiness in the novel as a stand-in for feminism, we really can read Lydia Bennett as, as a pretty strong and a pretty uh, impressive character. I also really like about the title that we are leading with scandalous. So um, we all know from Pride and Prejudice, I'm assuming that people who are reading this have already read Pride and Prejudice, but maybe um, maybe you just saw the movie, which is also awesome. Really great movie. Um, I'm thinking of the Kira Knightley one with Matthew McFadden, but there's also the one with um, Colin Firth. I can't remember who else is in that. I think like, I don't know, like Kate Winslet maybe? Um, but here we have this idea of scandal, and anyone who has read uh, Pride and Prejudice or even seen the movie knows that Lydia Bennett is embroiled in scandal. So I really like the idea of leading with scandal, but I also really like this idea of confession. So of course, um, a confession is is that always tantalizing. It's usually very intimate. So, you know, you have something that that's really, someone is really bearing their soul, which I mean, what more can you ask for in a novel? So I really think the title is functioning very well. And I really actually like the way that they have formatted it here. Again, really leading with Lydia Bennett, which, but also underscoring both the scandal and the fact that she's really going to confess to us. She's really going to lay it all out. Okay, so now we are going to go ahead and open up the book. This introduction is so strong. What Melinda Taub is doing here is really laying out, um, you know, a lot of what is to come and helping us really focus. One of the things I, I like to remind you of here at the Fox page is that reading the first couple of paragraphs closely will really help you get the most out of what you are reading. So here they are. I suppose if this were a proper book, I'd begin it something like, Miss Lydia Bennett, youngest of five daughters, to a father hopelessly entailed, had few advantages in life, but not too few to squander. That sounds fine and important 
and promises that no matter how exciting the story may become, it will all resolve with a tidy moral at the end. That is why Kitty and I prefer to skip the last chapters of novels. However, that bit about squandering isn't true. Oh, I dare say many in Meriton would whisper that I had squandered all my advantages of birth and position, and that, and that much is true, and Lord knows I have shed many a tear over it. However, I was born with greater gifts than one silly girl can use up in a lifetime. Kitty is proof enough of that. For another thing, I am not the youngest of five daughters. I am the youngest of seven. This is such a great opening. So one of the real treats, one of the real joys of reading these Jane Austen inspired novels is that we get to dwell a little longer in Jane Austen's language. So of course, a novel like this will pick up threads of the plot and really um, you know, develop things or you know, work contrary to them. But one of the things that I think is always such a joy is to really sort of immerse ourselves again in that Regency era language. The Regency is like, 1800 to 1815 roughly it's kind of the napoleonic wars importantly napoleon in france is like going around and trying to you know um, rule over all of europe and so england is at war in fact hence the militia this is the regency era um, where a lot of what is happening here in this book is important to remember historically so it's so delightful to be able to dwell again in this world of jane austen but i also am so intrigued to see the ways in which the author decides to depart from Jane Austen's language. So those of you who listened to the Pride and Prejudice lecture know that Jane Austen uses a third person omniscient narrator. So, you know, Lydia Bennett did this and Mary Bennett did that. But what we have here, in fact, is a first person narrator. And that's very important because we want to hear the intimate story. We want to hear from Lydia Bennett in the first person. It's always exciting when these books are in first person because we're getting the story from someone like who was there, you know, who was actually at Longbourn and actually getting up to all the crazy stuff that happens in Pride and Prejudice. There's also, of course, um, an intimacy. So whenever you have a first person narrator, whenever the narrator is saying, I did this and I did that, there is an assumption kind of a philosophical thing here, actually, um, that there is a you, that there is a recipient, that this story that I, the narrator, am telling, I am telling it to you, the reader. So whether or not you have really thought about that doesn't matter because you already instinctively are feeling the intimacy of the I and you that comes with the first person narrator addressing a reader. It's so cool though, because also in this book, it turns out the confessions are also meant for a specific recipient. And we're gonna get to that, but that's one of the kind of intrigues and one of the sources of tension. And honestly, again, I sometimes feel like such a lazy reader. Uh, I, I just couldn't figure out who it was, which is so silly. I mean, at the end I was like, oh, of course, which that is um, a very good sign of a book where you can't quite figure it out and then it seems totally inevitable. That means that uh, Melinda Taub has really done her work here. So not only is this a scandalous confession that is aimed at a reader, but it is also in fact aimed at someone in the book. So we have this, this kind of departure with the first person narrator in opposition to Jane Austen's third, but we also have this excellent parroting of the Austen language in that little quoted section that says, Miss Lydia Bennett, youngest of five daughters to a father hopelessly entailed, had few advantages in life, but not too few to squander. This is so good. It is not obviously taken verbatim from Pride and Prejudice, but the language is very, very close to what Jane Austen would use. It's in the third person. You know, you have Miss Lydia Bennett, blah, blah, blah. But it's also reminding us of some very important things. It's setting context. It's grounding us in the idea that there are five daughters, which is important because at the end of these two paragraphs, she's going to contradict that. There are the five daughters and that also um, one of the main sources of, of tension in Pride and Prejudice is this idea that they do not stand to inherit Longbourn because it is entailed to Mr. Collins, their cousin. So we are reminded of all of this stuff in a very efficient way that is also in fact immersing us again into this language of Jane Austen. It's so well done. It's also an excellent nod to the humor in Jane Austen, this idea that like she didn't have many advantages, but she threw them away. 
We also, in the second paragraph, which we just read, we learn that there is a little bit of remorse. So one of the fun things about reading about Lydia Bennett is, of course, she is embroil embroiled in scandal, and we, we don't really, um, you know, we don't have a lot of sympathy for Lydia. And yet here, we have this idea that she's a little bit contrite, she's a little remorseful, and also we have the idea that if she is, you know, a little scandalous and, and you know, a little bit uh, not so awesome at the beginning of the book, there's a lot lots of room for her to evolve. So I am not someone who needs to see lots of evolution in every character of every novel, but it is just like a very basic thing about novelistic writing that the reader feels very satisfied when we begin with someone and we see their evolution over time. So it's excellent that she's reminding us here of the fact that she has squandered many of her resources, but also that she is somewhat remorseful. It is excellent. We also, in the second paragraph, are um, you know given the idea that something's up with Kitty, which is a major plot point and an important one, and then also this idea that there are seven daughters, not five. So again and again and again in this novel, Melinda Taub is giving us these really excellent, um, you know, sort of points of intrigue. We're like, wait, there's seven daughters? And then you're kind of like, wait, did I miss that in Pride and Prejudice? Which is exactly what she's wanting, of course. So it's really, really well done. And these first two paragraphs do um, what good first paragraphs do, which is they really um, sort of clue us in to what we should be paying attention to, and they give us a sense of all the novel is going to deliver. And again, this one really does deliver. Now that we have uh, talked a bit about the opening of the book and the excellent use of narrative stance and uh, of Jane Austen's language and a few of the choices that Taub is making, we're gonna talk briefly about the structure of the book. I thought the structure was so good. You will have noticed, um, or maybe not, but I'm going to tell you right now, that the, the beginning of the book uh, here is in present tense. So when she's saying, I suppose if this were a proper book, I would begin it something like this. So that is in the present tense. And very quickly we learn that the present tense is uh, in fact Newcastle and it is after the end of Pride and Prejudice. And what we have here is Mr. Wickham and Lydia um, who are supposed to be married not going to spoil anything for you, but they are in Newcastle and the first person present tense is describing what is happening then. So essentially the front story, meaning the present moment, is this time in Newcastle where we have Lydia Bennett writing this confession. And I am not someone who really loves the present tense. It feels sometimes a little gimmicky. It feels like very kind of now, like very 21st century in ways that I'm just sometimes, sometimes it just doesn't sit well with me. But I really liked it here because it is combined with the past tense. So we have this front story where, it, you know, Lydia is in Newcastle with Wickham and she is writing this confession to someone you know, intrigue. Uh, but we also have all of these flashbacks. So many of them are to Brighton. So she'll tell the story of what was happening in Brighton, which is so cool. So what we know from Jane Austen is, is relatively glossed over. We don't have a lot of information about what happened in Brighton. I mean, what was going on in Brighton was staying in Brighton. But you have this idea here of Mrs. Forrester having taken Lydia to Brighton with the militia, and then, you know, they've eloped, and the rest of it is, uh, you know, sort of told from the perspective of the people in Longbourn, not from Lydia. So filling in the gaps of what happened at Brighton is so satisfying for the reader. So Taub is also doing this very cool thing, and the best of these, uh, you know, Jane Austen sort of derivatives do this, which is that she was really answering questions that I didn't even know I had. There's this delightful whole section where she is essentially describing how it is that Charlotte Lucas and Mr. Collins fall in love. That's another thing that Jane Austen, um, you know, glosses over, and for good reason. Like, Jane Austen can't really, like, dive into every single aspect of what is happening in Pride and Prejudice. But what we have here, in fact, is, is some really good sort of elucidation of how these things actually went down. There's also a whole explanation um, of Darcy's coldness. It's funny, I didn't even really realize that I was wondering why he was a little standoffish and a little cold. I guess I just expected that he was, like, some super rich bastard or something. I mean, not... I shouldn't say bastard, probably that's not a word we should say anymore. 
wow, yikes. Um, but I thought he was this kind of a dick. But it turns out he's not, in fact, just a dick. It turns out that Mr. Darcy, you know, there, there's some conjecture made by Melinda Taub that's a pretty good explanation for why, in fact, Mr. Darcy is, in fact, a little cold and why he does not trust charm and why he does not trust the idea of, of Elizabeth, you know, loving him and why he, in fact, has some difficulties with, with intimacy. So there's some, some questions being answered by Taub, again, that I didn't even know I had. And th that is a delightful piece of why this structure works so well, because we have, in fact, this front story, but we also have a, a, like a further exploration of what was going on in the novel that we know so well in Pride and Prejudice. It's so good. The other thing that this complexity of the novel, this fact that we have the front story and then we have these flashbacks to what's happening in Brighton and what happened with the elopement and what's happening with the different people in the novel, is that we have all of these subplots that emerge. They're so good. Um, and it, it feels a little bit sometimes like there's a lot going on, but Taub is very good at keeping all of these strands, you, you know, sort of woven in a nice way, not tangled, and really grounds us and, and makes things very clear. So of course we have this idea of Lydia and Wickham. We get much more uh, information about what's happening with them. And let me tell you, it is uh, not what you would have expected from Pride and Prejudice. We also have the story um, line with Kitty that I alluded to earlier. It's a major plot point. It's very compelling and it's very interesting and it's very magical. So it, it, it was unexpected, certainly. And it does, you know, in Pride and Prejudice, they're, they're such a unit, Lydia and Kitty. And, and now you, you learn why in this book in a way that is, again, very interesting. We also have this whole subplot, this whole storyline with Georgiana Darcy. We have uh, the story of Maria Lamb. Um, I keep wanting to call her Mariah because, um, you know, I talked about this before, when uh, Rosamund Pike reads Pride and Prejudice, which is just like such a dream. I still don't know how she did that amazing performance with all those voices. But when she calls Maria, I don't even remember who Maria was, but she says Mariah. Um, and I wanted to say Mariah for Mariah Lamb. But in fact, the reader of uh, Confessions of Lydia Bennett which is an excellent audio version, by the way, but she calls her Maria. So I'm gonna call her Maria Lamb. Importantly, Maria Lamb is a character in this book uh, who is not made up out of whole cloth. She was a character who appeared, you learn this in the acknowledgements of this book. I'm not, this is not because of my incredible sleuthing skills, um, but you learn in fact that Maria Lamb was in Jane Austen's novel, Sanditon. So Sanditon was a book, the book that Jane Austen was writing when she died. And uh, it was not published during her lifetime. I don't know if someone finished it or if they published it, you know, sort of unfinished, but it was published posthumously. And um, Maria Lamb is a character who appears there which is good because uh, this character really widens the scope of the novel. Suddenly we are talking about colonialism and the ethics of colonialism, and we are talking about trade, and we're talking about race and marriage and what is owed people and who we are paying and the debts that we have. So it's, it's a very, um, very, I think, astute and really interesting world to wade into with us. But if Jane Austen hadn't, in fact, introduced Maria Lamb, I might have been like, ooh, this is kind of a lot. Like, we're really tackling a lot. But it feels very well earned because, in fact, it was a character who Jane Austen had uh, had introduced. We also, of course, have this entire world of magic. And, the, I mean, I have to say, I was expecting a little more just like straight up like witchiness. I'm very interested in witches right now. I mean, I am just really doing a lot of thinking about witches and the idea of, of witches. I mean, really, when you think about witches, when I think about witches, it's really just thinking about persecution of very strong women. And I really feel like witches are kind of having a moment. Well, it's not even that they're having a moment. They've never not had a moment. I mean, really like right from the Salem witch trials, which as an American, that's kind of like my touch point, but it goes obviously way, way back, much further than that. You think of Shakespeare, you think of the weird sisters in Shakespeare who are so important. And you think of um, the Crucible, 
I mean, not the Salem witch trials, but you know, that was also the McCarthy era. Like witches, witches have always, always been a very important thing, you know, since, since humankind. And in fact, I love all of the ways that witches really, not only are they strong women, but they're strong women who are really using the domestic arts. You know, there's lots of herbs, there's lots of cauldrons. It's like a lot of cooking. It's a lot of cooking. It's a lot of spices. It's a lot of combining different things like eye of newt, you know, hair of frog or hair of frog. You, you get the picture. Um, but there's also in this book, which I loved, there's a lot of um, fiber stuff happening, meaning like there's a lot of braiding together of ribbons or um, tying of knots, which is so cool on the part of Melinda Taub because it's very um, domestic. Like we're really elevating the idea of women and domestic work to the level of witchiness which is so cool. So um, this is a very important sort of piece of the story, all of this idea of witchiness, not only because you can read it as a feminist, but also because it's just very cool. And it's a very, um, it is a departure. You know, there's not a lot of like witchiness happening in Pride and Prejudice. But it also uh, comes, She's. it's very sort of well-earned because it comes from a lot of folklore from, uh, you know, a long, long, long time ago in England. I'm thinking of like, the Druids and like Stonehenge, which I don't even know if that's the same thing, but like, you know, ancient, ancient stuff. I'm thinking of all that like Celtic stuff, like all of the, the pre-Christian stuff that was happening with the pagans and, you know, like Christmas, isn't Christmas like all of the Christmas tree and like the lights and the fact that we celebrated on the 25th, like, isn't it all together with like winter solstice kind of stuff? So all of that magic she is pulling from folklore that is in fact somewhat familiar to us and really grounds the magical parts of the book. Um, again, it, it's not quite so much just like magic so much as it's also a lot of fantasy. There is literally a dragon, um, but also actually the dragon whose name I'm not going to tell you exactly what's going on there, but there's somebody called Wormenheart, and it turns out, in fact, that Wormenheart is from um, from the folklore of this area of Hertfordshire or something. I don't think that's probably how you pronounce that, but you know what I'm saying here. So I think, again, Melinda Tab has really earned a lot of the magic stuff, um, a lot of the fantasy stuff, because she's building it on, um, you know, stories that have resonated through eons with humankind. Now that we have had our look uh, at, at the different subplots and the incredible structure and the fact that that complex structure allows for all of those different subplots, we're going to move on to figurative language. So those of you um, who have listened to the Fox page for a long time know that I have very, very high uh, standards where figurative language is concerned. So a lot of people do figurative language. They just kind of like feel like maybe they have to throw in a metaphor or a simile or maybe they fancy themselves a bit of a poet. And honestly, sometimes it really doesn't work. So anyone, uh, you know, who fancies themselves a writer out there and who's interested in writing, or if you just want to understand figurative language better, I have some thoughts on metaphor and simile. So a metaphor is the whole goal is to help the reader understand something more completely. So say you have item A or person A or emotion A, and you want your reader to get a full sense of what that is, you maybe would compare it with item B or feeling B or place B or whatever image B. So if you compare A to B, your reader is going to understand A much more completely. The problem is when someone takes A and they compare it to like number 67. You know, like if you compare it to something that's just like way too far afield and your reader's like, wait, what does A have to do with 67? Like where did 67 come from? Which, I mean, decent question. Like where did that come from? Um, so you have this sense that like something is too far away. And as soon as the reader's like, wait, I don't understand the connection between these things, then you're sunk. Like then your metaphor or your simile is simply not working or your symbolism or whatever it is that you're trying to do with language, like the extra work that language is doing. So as soon as you have something like that, that doesn't work, it really doesn't work. And, and Taub does such a good job with this. So she has lots of figurative language and some of it is, um, it feels like maybe a little bit, um, you know, not necessarily obvious, that's not quite right, but it might feel like even a tad bit cliche, but she does such a good job of, of if it is a bit cliche or a bit sort of, um, you know, a, a somewhat common metaphor, she will in fact make it her own in ways that are very compelling. So we're gonna dive in and take a look at some of the figurative language 
It's also fun to do this because in each one of these cases, uh, we're getting to look at her excellent prose and at different parts uh, of the novel itself. We're gonna begin on page 38. So I love this in part because it is gonna ground us a little bit in history. So those of you who uh, maybe don't quite remember why we call the Regency era, the Regency era, that is because it was during the, the time of all those King Georges, um, and one of them, George III, was in fact, uh, he was, you know, um, declared insane. And apparently when they declare you insane, you can no longer be the king. And so what they do, they, I don't even know who this is, the people in the royal echelons, they appoint a prince regent. In this case, it was uh, George III's son, I believe, who eventually would become George IV. But there was a period of time where he, as prince regent, was serving on behalf of his father, George III. I'm pretty sure he's the son. Mm. But anyway, you know, this is the prince regent. And that period of time we call the regency. So this is the beginning of, uh, you know, beginning of the 19th century. Let me tell you, regency era, excellent, excellent time for, uh, for any kind of television drama. I mean, honestly, movies and TV set in the regency era, there is nothing like those to make you want to like try a new hairdo, for example. So we have here this reminder, essentially, with this figurative language here, about this idea of the Prince Regent. This is when Lydia is talking to some women and the idea of the Prince Regent comes up. If one goes later, there is always the tiresome crush of people around HRH, and Mama cannot abide it. HRH? I ventured to ask. Why, His Royal Highness, of course, the Prince Regent. We see him all the time at Brighton, naturally. She paused to take a swallow of punch. It was a bit like saying you lived next door to the man in the moon. So we have this idea of the moon. Um, there's something very fanciful about a prince and a moon. These are kind of these like fairy tale symbols in lots of ways. And we also have the idea that it, it's a perfect analogy. Like the man in the moon does not exist. It's so kind of fanciful and sort of um, childish on some level. And the idea of this prince, it's as if he also does not exist. So it's that perfect, um, you know, analogy that perfect comparison, because the reader's like, oh yeah, what she's telling us here, in fact, is that it feels like the Prince Regent doesn't even exist, like he can't, like he's a fairy tale. So it's a very, very good metaphor. I also like this idea that, you know, the moon is something that you would do when you are sleeping. And so you have this idea of sleeping, you know, next to the man and the moon, but there's also this idea of dreaminess. There's also the idea, of course, um, that the moon Whenever you're reading and someone mentions the moon, you should always think of women and the strength of women. So here we have the man in the moon. Um, so we have this idea of men and women kind of mushed together in this interesting way, in very much the same way that, you know, the whole point of these Regency novels is to mush men and women together. So I really love this figurative language here, not only because it is placing us in history, but also because it is so well done. So on page 49, I love this part. This was when, uh, when, uh, the, the women are together, some, some of the witches. And I really love, there was a lot of nudity among those witches. It's very pagan, you know, they would get out there and like take off their shifts, their night shifts, and they would all be, you know, racing around naked. In fact, there's some funny moments about nudity that come uh, later in the book. But they are, uh, you know, casting some spells and doing some, some witchy stuff. And we have this. Smoke billowed forth and I began to cough. I heard others try to smother their coughs, but I couldn't. My eyes watered. I could not see precisely what she was doing. None of us could, I suspect. When Mama is working on an especially intricate bit of needlework, I can tell she's doing something. A line of black stitches here, a blotch of red there, and a riot of rainbow-colored threads hanging below her hoop but it can take days or weeks to see the final shape. I mean, of course, as a fiber artist myself, this really spoke to me here, but we have this really um, nice way that she says, okay, um, you know, I don't know what she's doing. And then without explaining and without saying, this reminded me of one time when I was watching Mama, she simply starts the part here. It's so well done. Um, she's saying, I couldn't really see what she was doing. When Mama is working on an especially intricate bit, like she's trusting the reader to understand that this idea of Mama doing embroidery is going to tell us more about the magic. So they're, they're pretty, um, you know, distinct experiences, but they work so well together. I love the way that this is really underscoring the domestic feel of a lot of this magic. 
These are women who are doing it. Again, these are domestic things like, you know, they're tying ribbons and tying knots and using little hairs and they're, you know, using buttons and all of these different things. In fact, their magic requires a lot of self-sacrifice. Anytime they want to do anything magical, they have to sacrifice something important to them, which is literally, I mean, it is the lot of many, many women to self-sacrifice. But here we have this excellent underscoring of the domestic nature of the magic. And we also, it's, it's a very skillful way of saying like she didn't really understand what was happening and she knew she needed to be patient, much like how, you know, things would slowly be revealed uh, by her mother's fiber art. It also is, in fact, um, a little nod to the reader to be like, reader, you got to be a little patient here. You will fully understand how all of this science works, but you got to just like chill and you got to just be patient and you will fa fairly soon understand sort of the, the way that the science works and the cosmology and the logic of this world of, of magic that we have wandered into. Okay, then on page 81, this is Lydia thinking about not having been invited to a party. I've scarcely been invited to a single social event since he joined them, but I do not think it is a deliberate snub aimed at me. They're simply not having any parties they could invite a lady to. Even a lady such as I, who is possessed of her own, though comparatively small and fluffy, cloud of scandal. I love, of course, the echo of the title. I always love an echo of the title. So this idea of scandal and the word being at the end of the sentence is excellent because we're moving toward it and then we're sort of ending with this idea of scandal. But we have this really nice picture of the cloud of scandal and what she's adding, the figurative language comes in this like parenthetical part where she's saying, um, she says, a woman such as I, who is possessed of her own, parentheses, though comparatively small and fluffy, end parentheses, cloud of scandal. What's so funny there is like um, a small cloud of scandal wouldn't be that interesting, but a small and fluffy cloud of scandal is so good. Fluffy is excellent there because it is reminding us a bit of the lightness of the levity in Jane Austen. Um, it's very important as we discussed in the lecture on Pride and Prejudice, it's very important to recognize the satire and the humor and the irony that Jane Austen is wielding. So this kind of idea of a small and fluffy cloud of scandal is really underscoring that aspect of Austen, but it's also just funny. And it's also, again, kind of reminding us that, that this tale of Lydia, it's not some grave, you know, heavy story. It is, in fact, very light in lots of ways. Okay, we're going to look at page uh, 145. So I loved this. I love this one too. I'm going to say that apparently every single page that we turn to with this figurative language. This is about her parents, about Lydia's parents. Um, up at the top of the page on 145, she says, if there is anything fiercer than a dragon, it's papa. So this is a very um, good metaphor. So a simile just uses like or as. But this idea of, of um, you know, comparing her papa to a dragon is, you know, it maybe seems like a little bit cliche, but not really. I mean, the fierceness of the dragon too, the fact that she's underscoring one aspect of the dragon, I think is very strong. It's also important, of course, because there is an actual dragon in this story. So we have this idea here of, of pulling the worlds of magic and uh, her actual life together. But I love that. If there's anything fiercer than a dragon, it's papa. Which I have to say, um, Melinda Taub seems to really be coming down uh, on the side of uh, Mr. Bennett as in the novel as really being like a little kind of crotchety and not that happy with his life and kind of miserable with his wife and all of this stuff. I mentioned um, during the uh, podcast on Pride and Prejudice that um, I think the movie in fact, has really colored my interpretation of the Bennett family because Donald Sutherland in that movie is like actually very kind of fond and he's, he, you know, it's sort of, he's teasing everyone, but really he seems like he loves everyone and especially Lizzie, but like, you know, it seems like he likes his wife well enough. And so in my mind, I was really wanting to believe that was the case when in fact, um, I do think Jane Austen uh, and in fact, Melissa Taub here are coming down on the side of maybe he's not actually that happy and a lot of his satire is used because in fact, he is just like needs a way to like push against his miserable life, maybe. I don't know. Um, it's less fun. It's less fun to think about him as like a curmudgeon. Way more fun to think about him as like fond and teasing. Okay, so we have this idea of Papa as being a dragon and then down a little further, when it's a question of having fun, mama is as reliable as the rising sun. Unfortunately, 
so is Papa. So I love here the idea of a mama as being reliable as the rising sun. I mean, being as reliable as the sun is not that interesting, but I like the idea of, of including the, the fun part here. What she is reliable for is fun. I like the fact that fun and sun rhyme. I think that's very sweet. Um, you know, you might think that's like a little like cheese ball, but I actually really think it works here. It's very sunny. You know, what we're describing here is fun and sun. And so I think it, it really works well. So we have this idea of her being reliable and always providing sun, always providing fun. And then we go right straight into this next paragraph that says, unfortunately, so is Papa. And one of the reasons why this works so well is that just above this, um, at the top of the page, we have this idea, if there is anything fiercer than a dragon, it's Papa. So we really have her sense is very clear there of how her father is. And then we have this idea that the reason it's problematic that um, he is also reliable is that he is going to quash all of the fun, in fact, that Mama is going to produce. Okay, we're going to look at page 194. So this is when they are um, dancing together, Wickham and Lydia. There you are, I said, striving to paddle back to shore from the deep waters I'd felt I'd somehow waded into. Aren't you going to waltz me? Listen, they're starting. So you have this idea here, um, I mean, you know, being in deep water is definitely a cliche, but this idea of paddling back um, is really well done. But this idea of paddling back is really good. And the idea of things floating, the idea of deep water, all of their dresses and, and the dance, you know, people floating around and paddling around makes a lot of sense to me visually when you imagine people at, at a dance, you know, sort of in these prescribed routes the way that you might uh, with boats. So um, you have this idea here of her paddling back. And I also liked that um, she was talking about having wandered into the water. Part of me was like, wonder if she should have said waited, you know, to make it more kind of um, like make it feel less like it's a mixed metaphor, but actually waited would have been way too much. Like we don't want her wading into the water and then paddling back, like that would have been too much. So I think Taub was really judicious here because she talks about paddling back into the water she'd wandered into. I also like the repetition of water and wandered. Um, it's really, it's very, very well done. There's also something on this page that I have marked here and I want to read. Um, it's not in fact figurative language so much, but it was such an interesting observation and one I really enjoyed. And there are lots of these throughout the book, which is another aspect that Taub I think does so well. So this is Wickham talking. The music, he said, a man in Austria wrote this, just a man, just a stinking, selfish, distractible human scratched it out on tree pulp, and then it traveled across countries and through wars and arrived here. And though none of us speak his language and most don't know his name, he speaks to us exactly as he intended to. He tells our bodies how to move to it almost without learning the steps. One, two, three, one, two, three. I was astonished to see that he had tears in his eyes. God, how beautiful it is. So I really love this. I'm not focusing here on the figurative language so much as the, the real kind of genius of this idea that I hadn't truly thought about before is that, and I, it's so funny in here when she says, though not everyone knows his name or many don't know his name, I think she's talking about Mozart. I think he's talking about Mozart, but Taub also. I think Wickham here is talking about Mozart. I don't know if he's like a big waltz guy, but I definitely think he's Austrian. Oh my God. I mean, I am not a music uh, expert by any stretch. So it's this really excellent idea, in fact, of, um, uh, you know, of music as being this kind of universal language. It makes me think of like, like why, like symphonies work. Like, isn't there a symphony like Peter and the Wolf or something where they like, you know, like piccolo is like the bird or whatever. I don't know. Um, it's a bit of an aside, but it really adds some depth, certainly to Wickham's character, but also to the novel as a whole. We have another um, excellent piece of figurative language that's happening at one of these balls. I want to touch on this just very briefly. I followed her gaze and found Miss Lamb. There she sat like a songbird surrounded by ravens. Half a dozen young men flocked around her. This idea of Miss Lamb being at the dance and being um, surrounded by ravens, like a songbird surrounded by ravens, is so 
great. We have the idea of her being colorful, of her being, you know, um, like dainty and like sweet and, you know, singing kind of a pretty little tune. And then we have the ravens, which of course they're all in their tuxedos and they're all kind of black and you can imagine all the backs of all of these birds, these ravens. And, and they're somewhat sort of predatory and menacing in some ways. It's really well done. My only problem is I really don't think she needed that second, uh, that second sentence. If I had the privilege, in fact, of editing um, Miss Laub, Miss Laub, Miss Taub, um, I, in fact, might have suggested that we omit that. I just don't think it's necessary. It's kind of like explaining your joke. So she says, there she sat like a songbird surrounded by ravens. Half a dozen young men flocked around her. So I just don't think she needs it. We got it. We got the picture. We got the image. We know what she's talking about. And then, of course, the idea that the young men were flocking, it's kind of like how it was better that she said wandered and not like waited. Um, I think it's just we didn't need two different bird metaphors here. Um, you know, just a tiny, tiny quibble because the rest of her figurative language is so good. Uh, the last example we're looking at, actually, there are two more. One's on 256. And I liked this one because it's very meta. So um, when I say meta, I just mean that it's it's sort of referring back to itself. It's referring back to the, the process of writing or referring back to the text and the idea of, of language as being an artifice and this idea of language um, here as being the medium through which the book is constructed. So on 256, it's the end of a chapter. Her chapter endings are excellent. They're so, um, they're intrigue and kind of cliffhangery, but like not too, really very strong. So um, at the end, Lydia says this, I shan't be able to write outdoors anymore. Though the weather has been briefly so fine, there's a nasty storm coming. That sounds like a metaphor, but I just mean it's going to rain tomorrow. So I love this. I love this kind of consciousness of like what the text is doing, like that she is writing a confession. We're also reminded, in fact, that the narrator is writing a confession. So it's it's this very, I, I love it. I'm a sucker. I'm a sucker for um, all the meta stuff. I'm a sucker for someone being like, oh, sounds like a metaphor. Um, you could say it's a little heavy handed, but it was totally not for me. I really, I really enjoyed that. The last one we're going to look at is on page 28, and this is where um, I really got the idea that Melinda Taub is not thinking, in fact, that um, that Mr. Bennett is like a fond, you know, uh, you know, kind of teasing father and husband, but is in fact actually kind of miserable. So on um, on 28 we have this. My father, as you can see, is a monster. I mean, it's interesting because you know there's earlier the thing about him being a dragon. My father, as you can see, is a monster. You know how it was with our family, yes? Our lovely house, Longbourn, was our father's, along with enough land to keep us in gowns and lace and a serviceable carriage. But it was entailed to the male line, and we had no brother. And altogether, our situation was a bit like eternally picnicking at the edge of a crumbling cliff. My father's favorite pastime was mocking my mother's fear of falling. This is such an apt metaphor. It's so good. It's actually a simile, I think, because she says like. Um, she says, our situation was a bit like eternally picnicking at the edge of a crumbling cliff. In fact, eternally. I don't even have a problem here with the adverb. Usually adverbs are uh, just a no-go. Usually it means that you're sort of leaning on them in a way that you should just like pick a better verb, really. But eternally here is so good because it's like, it's like the afterlife, like forever and ever. It's like they're condemned to like picnicking on a cliff. I'm picturing, by the way, in my mind, like literally like the cliffs of Dover, like those big white cliffs, like that obviously has nothing to do with Longbourn, um, but that is what I'm picturing. Very dangerous to be, you know, picnicking on the edge of the cliffs of Dover. But it's such a good, um, it's such a good metaphor simile because we have this idea it's perfect for the era like you would have all these picnics I'm picturing like Howard's End or something but you would have them picnicking and it would be this very elaborate affair and you know you'd have all the servants and you would have like the cold chicken and you would have the port and you would have the jellies and the aspic or whatever but you would have all of this kind of finery um, th that would be on the edge of the cliff it's this perfect example of like the the, the sort of facade and and kind of like all of the frippery and all of the the, the fanciness but in fact, having it feel very, very unstable is perfect. But again, what she is underscoring here is the fact that his favorite thing is to mock the mother. The poor woman, like she's just overwhelmed. She's got five daughters. Like I just, wow, this is such an apt metaphor. Oh, I was gonna end right there. But in fact, I need to just underscore this one thing, which is that 
all of this figurative language is not just like a cool way to like tell us a little bit more about each character or the situations. It is in fact, I think, inviting us to do something much more important, which is this, it's twofold. One is that we are really meant to sort of examine this idea that something is not always just itself. It's often something else. So Lydia Bennett, yes, is like a spoiled brat who's only thinking of herself, but she's also apparently a witch. And she's also someone, you know, who has her own confessions and she has her own, um, you know, uh, concerns and she has her own interests. So we have this idea of things as being many different things, which is very important because, of course, all of this Regency stuff is really very much about facades and it's very much about, um, you know, the aristocracy and sort of how, how precarious in many ways that that aristocratic lifestyle is was and should, in fact, be. Um, but you have this idea of metaphors and similes as reminding us, in fact, that lots of things, th they may be what they appear, but they also may be many other things. More importantly, potentially, is this underscoring throughout the whole book of the idea that all of this kind of magic, all of these things that these women are doing, because all the witches are women, really can be read as, as feminism. It can be read, all of the magic can be read as, as sort of um, these powerful women who are able to control things and make things happen and, and make things that are otherworldly come to pass. And really sort of bringing a lot of the domestic sphere, a lot of the domestic arts, into um, you know contexts where they are doing much more than just darning. You know they're not just darning and mending and patching. They are in fact um, really making a lot of important things happen. Um, the other thing and the last thing is that I think this idea of this magic, you know, the, the sort of cosmology, the, the the logic of the magic in this book, is that you have to sacrifice something that is important for you in order for magic to happen. And I think that we can look at that idea of self-sacrifice as really um, having everything to do with the idea of marriage in this book and, and sort of like your future and your security. So I really love the idea that Melinda Taub is, is using lots of really excellent figurative language, but she's also using it to help us understand that, that feminism is a big part of this book, but also that women in this era, um, you know, had to sacrifice a huge amount women are still sacrificing a huge amount. But, you know, th there is this idea here of the marriage contract and the process of marriage as really being unfair and requiring a lot of sacrifice on the part of women. Not to end on like such a such a dour note, but I'm going to leave it there. I really hope that you enjoyed um, our dive into the scandalous confessions of Lydia Bennett, which I really enjoyed really, uh, you know, digging into Melinda Taub and was very impressed. So get yourself back to the Fox page and check out, uh, you know, a couple more Jane Austen derivatives that are heading your way. Happy reading. <laughs>